Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me uh, introduce the topic of my presentation, which is uh, the development of a canard-based vertical orientation system for high power. And before I go further, let me see if I can get this presentation up in the right way. Okay, I think that looks okay. So first, let me just go ahead and uh, introduce myself. Uh, as I say, my name is Jim Jarvis, and I started the first time in model rocketry back in 1962, and I came back to rocketry as a bar in 2003. And um, going to the last bullet, uh, there's a couple things that I particularly like uh, about high power rocketry. One is uh, high altitude staged rockets. And uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, what I call vertical orientation systems. And let me just do one thing here. Okay, so the first thing is let me just briefly mention what a vertical orientation system is, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically what I'm talking about here are these canards at the top of the rocket, and those are movable canards, and they're the things that basically can make the rocket change its orientation. Uh, and if you want to go vertical, then uh, you would be changing the orientation to be vertical. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what vertical orientation systems are. Um, I'll talk about the uh, what I call the VOS-1 system capabilities. And the, the VOS-1 system is what I've done most of my flights on uh, over time. So um, that's most of what the experience is that you'll see. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the flight results that I've had uh, and the lessons learned from those flights. Uh, and then last, I'll talk about future development. Uh, which includes uh, a VOS2 system, a redesigned system. And uh, I have a, that system out for beta testing with a group of flyers, and we're going to see what we can accomplish with it. So first off, what is the orientation system? Uh, basically, it has three parts. Uh, one is an IMU, an inertial measurement unit, to collect data on movement mainly from uh, the gyros in the system. And then there's a flight program that basically does the calculations to convert that IMU data into orientation versus time. And then the third component of it is a mechanical system that corrects the calculated orientation to the desired orientation. So you'll have a set point orientation. The system will measure where you actually are, and then the job system is to move the orientation to that desired orientation. And those mechanical systems can include canards, gas thrusters, moving fins and tabs, or gimbaled nozzles. And everything that I've done uh, in this area is with canards. So that's basically what I'm going to be talking about. The vertical orientation systems uh, are sometimes referred to as active systems or stabilization systems. Uh, or other names like that. I'm not really sure why they're called stabilization systems. They don't really stabilize anything. Um, they're really designed to change the orientation of the rocket. So that's what the VOS does. And uh, the things that it can do are to control tilt and bearing and roll angle. And, and if you do those things, you can control the uh, what I refer to as the approximate trajectory of the rocket. And I say it's approximate uh, because there's make it not possible to control the trajectory to an exact trajectory that you want. It's uh, at best approximate. Uh, some of the reasons for that are that canards are ineffective at low velocity. So at the start and end of the flight, when the velocity is low, the canards won't be doing any controlling. Uh, 
you have tilt bearing set points uh, in there, but they're not perfect. You're going to have electronics. They're, they're not gonna, going to have a, a zero error. There's going to be some sort of error with them. Uh, and also, if the, um, the, the airframe is not capable of flying in, in the way that you tell it to, then you're not going to reach your set points either. And in the case of gimbaled rockets, they're not going to do any control after burnout of the motor. And the last thing is the tra trajectory is affected by external factors, mainly the wind. So you can tell a rocket to fly vertical, uh, and it can be in that orientation. But during the entire ascent, the, the rocket is going to be blown in whichever direction uh, the wind happens to be blowing during the, uh, the ascent period. So consequently, uh, Voss system isn't very good at guidance, but it's good enough to where the primary value of it is to control rocket dispersion. So this is a picture of the uh, Hearn Airport where I, where I have the pleasure to fly from now and then. And I, I just have an example here where I have a uh, launch location here down uh, at the south end of these runways. Uh, and then we have some wind. So we have some wind on the ground and then we have some upper level wind that might be a little bit dire uh, different direction. And so most of the time, if you fly a rocket to say five or 6,000 feet, this is gonna be the, the dispersion that you get. Uh, you, you might weathercock into the wind and then drift back a little bit. So you might land out in this area, or you might go up pretty straight and then just drift with the wind and end up down in this area. So a pretty big area. And if you fly higher than, than that, that area simply gets larger and larger the higher that you go. So with the vertical orientation system, uh, although you can't control exactly where your aperture is going to be, it's going to be a lot closer. You're going to have a better better idea where you're going to go uh, than if you if you don't have such a system. And so I've, I've sort of depicted here the the landing area that you'll get uh, if you have a vertical orientation system. And you can see there's still several hundred feet in in air. Um, potentially within that range, because you don't know exactly where Aperture is going to be, and you don't know exactly what the upper level winds are going to be, but you can generally predict within a, a few hundred feet uh, where you're going to land uh, by using a vertical orientation system. So that's the primary value of it with respect to rocket uh, dispersion. Now, you can also fly a, a rocket at a tilt. It doesn't have to be exactly straight up. <clears throat> and if you do that, uh, you can fine tune the area uh, in one direction or another. Uh, and maybe there's one in particular uh, that you like that, that so, uh, sort of manages to avoid hazards as best as, uh, as you can. And so I actually did that flight trying to go to that checkmarked land or, or similar to that. And, and here's how it was laid out. So in this case, what I did is I launched the rocket and I told it to fly at a 12 degree angle to the west. And what I predicted was gonna happen was that it would drift with the wind on ascent and it, and it would be here at this point would be the what I predicted is the apogee. And then based on wind for the day, uh, I calculated where the rocket would drift to. And so here was the predicted landing point. And it turns out that uh, there was a little bit more wind than I thought. Uh, and so the, the actual apogee was a little further downwind than the predicted apogee. And the wind was a little bit more out of the south than I thought it would be. And so it actually drifted and landed to this position. So I almost outsmarted myself and landed in the trees. But even though I did that, uh, I'm still not very far away uh, on, on a very windy day uh, at the point where I thought the rocket was going to land. So 
So let me talk a little bit now about the Voss One system capabilities. These are the this is the system that I that I've flown most of my flights with, and and the the original inspiration for this was Alyssa Stenberg's presentation at NARAM 55, uh, and in that presentation she used the um, uh, the Guardian RC autopilot and managed to fly a model rocket uh, from a, a starting angle up to vertical. And, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I decided that uh, uh, I want. So I talked to some people. Uh, one of them was Frank Hermes, who does the, uh, the rocket tiltometer uh, uh, over the last few years. And he introduced me uh, to a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Bill Permerlani. And Bill is responsible for something called a, a Universal Development Board, a UDB. Uh, which is used for drones and for RC autopilot. And we decided that we would use that for um, data logging uh, and uh, along with the Guardian doing the, the control because the Guardian doesn't have the data logging capability. So we were going to do that. And, and then we looked at it and we realized that the UDB could basically do everything that the Guardian could do. Uh, and in addition, it could collect data uh, and you could program it. So we, we pretty quickly decided that, that we just wanted to use the UDB for, for doing this. And we, for about eight years now, and, you know, we'll do some flights and then we'll uh, add in a capability and then we'll do some flights to test that. And uh, then we won't fly for a while. We'll come back for a while and try something else. So it's been kind of off and on, um, but we've been at it for, for, for that period of time. And so the, the system is designed and programmed by Bill Permerlani. Uh, he's the uh, brains of the outfit, as I'm sure anyone that is familiar with this knows that uh, there's someone other than me that's the brains of it. I just get to fly the rockets, and so I think I have more fun. Um, but uh, Bill is the real brains behind it. And so here's some uh, statistics uh, on the board. Um, it uses uh, the modified matrix pilot firmware. Uh, the mathematics behind it are called uh, direction cosine matrix for the orientation calculations. Uh, and the, the board has some other features that are advantages. Uh, one of them is that you get sequential modulated outputs to your servo. So it makes the power management a little bit easier. So it's a good board for, for doing these, these sorts of things. And uh, we've, we've made over time, we've made just dozens and dozens of modifications for rockets, um, optimizing the, Servo ranges, you know, how much of the range do you use for yaw pitch and how much do you use for roll and what are the relative gains? Um, how do we mix those, those uh, signals? Um, how do we turn things on and off? Uh, we can turn on yaw pitch uh, when we want and we can trigger it with an altimeter or we can do it based on time. Uh, so there's, there's been some experiments with those, those sorts of things. There's, there's also a, a launch detect algorithm uh, and because uh, when, when you're doing tilt measurements uh, in a rocket, uh, you have to basically tell the gyros to stop looking at the accelerometers once the rocket is under acceleration and then deceleration. Uh, because if you don't, the gyros will think they're drifting and they'll try to correct for that drift because there's no uh, gravity reference anymore just start going off on their own. And so if you're doing a, a, a longer flight, you know, something uh, more than a model rocket, very, you know, a few seconds kind of a, a flight program, you have to turn off the accelerometers or, or things will go bad uh, over time. Uh, the launch detect is also something that we use to initiate the, uh, the control program if we have something in there based on time. And this process of turning off the accelerometers is something that is common uh, to the altimeters that, that measure tilt. The altus metrum and the featherweight, I presume, will do the same thing. Um, but 
those devices do basically the same thing. So some more modifications that we've done. Um, I've used relatively simple PNID control. Uh, it's, it's not really uh, a very complex what we do. Uh, for example, on yaw pitch, we're, we're just using simple proportion for that, where you're looking at the, what's the error between the angle that you're at and the angle that you want, uh, and the, the gain to the servos and the canards is proportional to that. Uh, we've, we've also added for yaw pitch control a, a derivative control so that if, we're, if, if the rocket is moving too fast towards or away the set point, uh, or away from the set point, uh, there's a derivative function that'll kind of slow, try to slow it down. So we do have that in there. For uh, well, we have something, we have a correction that's proportional to the roll rate of the rocket. So if the rocket is moving at uh, a, a larger angular mo movement in degrees per second, there will be a uh, a signal that's proportional to that roll rate to try to resist that roll. But we also have something in there that's called heading hold, which is uh, something that comes from RC helicopters. And basically what, it, what it's designed to do uh, is to hold the roll angle at a fixed point. And so as you roll away from your set point roll angle, it will generate a signal in proportion to that that tries to take the rocket back to the, the heading that, you, that the roll angle that you want it to be at. So um, as we've gone over time, we've, we've gone from the capability to make a change in tilt to the capability to control tilt and bearing. Uh, and so we decided we can do it a lot of times. So we have a spreadsheet that lets us program up to 100 changes in tilt or bearing within one flight and, and we can run that program. And, and the interesting thing about it is just to recognize that we're not just making changes in the position of the canards. Uh, what, what it's doing is it's actually looking at the position of the orientation of the rocket and then, and then deciding what control is necessary to take it to the next position. And then when the, the next set point comes along, it looks at the orientation that it got to, and it decides what corrections are needed to go to the next position. The other thing that's interesting is that the, or that, that is very useful is that the gyro offsets are determined on the pad uh, right up until the moment that you push the button. Uh, and in some cases, you might otherwise do gyro offsets on the bench or something like that. Um, and this does the flight. So you have the, the, the offsets and the, basically the drift is basically reduced to zero for all three axes. And uh, one of the things that makes this work is that the adjustment rate has been optimized. So we use a, a period of about 10 to 15 minutes to do these, these offsets. And the point of that is it's fast enough so that you're not going to hold up a launch because it's typically going to take you at least that long to get everything loaded up and ready to fly and then back to the flight line. So it's, it's short enough uh, in that respect. But, but the, the um, correction of the offsets is slow enough so that if the rocket moves, it doesn't affect the correction project, the correction process. So if it's moving because of wind, uh, uh, it's not going to affect the ability to determine the offsets. So th this is a graph that just shows how the offsets change, is, you know, from the time when you first turn on the system uh, over about a, a 20 minute period. And you can see that the, when you turn it on, you begin to, to do those corrections. And, and here, about five minutes into the process, is where we raise the rocket from horizontal to vertical. So you can see even a, a motion like that uh, doesn't have much effect on the ability to determine the offsets. And then by the time you get out to about 10 minutes, the, the offsets are pretty much stabilized. 
the mechanical design of the system uh, uses digital uh, RC servos. They're, they're nothing particularly fancy, except they are digital servos. Uh, and that's pretty important because you need to be able to set the center point of your canard so that you're aligned uh, with the uh, airframe. And then you also want to be able to set the endpoints for the canards, which is one of the ways that you can set the uh, different gains for from one flight to another. And I just use canards that are beveled G10 plate. And, and I, I know that there could be more uh, aerodynamic designs for that, but the advantage of using the flat plates is that they're just a heck of a lot easier to align with the, air, the airframe. And so we have some um, alignment guides that basically help you to um, do that alignment process and they depend upon the, the fins being flat. I also mount the canards directly to the servos. There's no there's no gearing uh, going on there, and and you know a disadvantage of that is you don't have maybe as much resolution in the in the movement of the canards. But the advantage of it is that you get the fastest response because you're not um, you know the time required for the the servo to make its motion is less if the if the motion required is less. So uh, that's how I've done it, and uh, is, I think it's worked pretty well. Uh, and then the last aspect of the mechanical design uh, is that we use bearings to protect the servo splines. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about them later on, but here's sort of a picture of what they look like. Uh, and in this case, the uh, this is sort of a round bearing, and it just happens to fit the, uh, the wheel that comes off of the servo. So this really protects the, the uh, from lateral forces. Uh, you have the canards on there, and when you're in flight, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of uh, torque on the servos itself, but there's a lot of uh, uh, lateral force on the servos, on the, on the servo splines. So you, you have to do something uh, to protect the servos from that, uh, and, and also to protect the servos from landing. So once we started putting in these bearings, uh, the system started working a whole lot better. And we stopped breaking servos, and, and uh, it was uh, sort of a, a very important thing from a mechanical point of view uh, to have, the, have these in there. So um, I've used the, the system in, in a, a number of different ways. Um, some of the initial flights were uh, with the uh, canards up on the top of the rocket and uh, some of the some of the initial flights just to sort of prove the system were that way and and I've also used the top of the rocket canards on two stage rockets and and here's sort of an example of uh, what that looks like but the, the the reason I actually built the system was that I, I wanted to put it between the stages of a staged rocket. So here you can see this was a, I think this was a, a, a Q to O flight, if I recall correctly. And the servos were located right here between the two stages. And the, the idea of that is that you launch the rocket um, with basically the, the, the control system being turned off. And then you get the burnout on the booster motor and the booster drops off. And, and now the, the canards are at the bottom of the rocket and they're in a position where they can uh, affect the trajectory of the flight. So at that point during the coast period, you turn on the control system and you try to bring the rocket back to vertical uh, so that you'll make the version of a high altitude flight. And I've, I've also used the system between the stages of a, a three-stage rocket, and you have to look kind of close, but that's where the canards were located there. So in, in this flight, the booster dropped off, uh, the control system corrected the orientation of the second and third stages, and then the control system falls off and, and uh, recovers on its own, uh, and then the sustainer motor fires after that.
And in, in many of these flights, um, in the process of the development, we decided that the, the control system needed to be used in combination with a, uh, what I call a spin can. Uh, and uh, I'm just, I'm just going to look and see if that video shows up for y'all. I hope it does. I didn't see that. Okay, so that's good news. It looks like you're going to be able to see uh, uh, some of the videos in this presentation. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about what the, uh, the purpose of the spin can here a little bit later in the presentation. So one of the things I kind of maintain uh, is a chart that just so shows some of the flights that have been done to date. And so th this particular chart shows the year uh, that, that uh, is involved. And I started this back in 2015. And then this is the month across the top of the chart. And if it's a, if it's a green dot, that means it was a good flight. Uh, yellow was sort of so-so and red means something happened that wasn't, wasn't what I wanted. And there's a lot of green dots on there. There's a few red ones, um, but uh, I've, I've had some interesting flights. So let me go ahead and uh, walk through some of those. The first successful flight I did was the, the third flight. And uh, on this flight, we, we, we had the control system at the top of the rocket and we went vertical with no roll. This was a K-1200 and it went to about 4,000 feet. Uh, and this is the first flight where we, we felt like that we actually uh, accomplished something useful and that we could tell that the, the control system actually worked and, and, and was functioning. So that kind of told us that, you know, we were indeed on the right path. Uh, and then this flight was, was intended to show the uh, the, the two-stage configuration that I talked about where the, the stabilization system, the, the orientation system was between the stages. So here again, you can see on the pick, here's where the, uh, where the orientation system was located. And so the purpose of the flight was to try that out. So we want to see the booster drop off, see the rocket go vertical during the coast period, and then be able to recover the orientation module on its own. And so you, you have to kind of watch this video pretty closely, but the first thing you see is the booster drop off there. Uh, and then it goes about doing the stabilization there. And then later on at the end of the coast period, the, the stabilization vertical orientation system will fall off. And, and had this flight had a motor in it, the motor would have lit at that point. Um, but this was just a test. So I didn't have a, uh, a, a motor in the sustainer. So uh, this particular flight done in September was, was where we identified that we needed to do something uh, to protect the servo splines because basically we flew a little faster and we broke the servos. So that's when we started looking at um, what could we do to protect those splines and, and at the same time also support them such that they're still free to turn and, and, and not restrict the, the motion of the servo. So we found, the, found these bearings and we put those into the airframes. And like I said, that worked a whole lot better for subsequent flights. Uh, this flight a couple of years later was where we identified something that's called the control reversal issue. Uh, and uh, this is an absolutely terrible picture over here on the right, but these are the canards on this particular rocket. And you can see the depiction of the vortices that the canards generate. And what happens is those vortices uh, go down the side of the rocket and they, they interfere or they hit the, the fixed fins down below the canards. Uh, and, and they'll actually interfere with the ability of the control system uh, and it can cause some pretty odd effects. So the vortices will interact with those fins. Uh, and in the case of roll, you can, you can actually be trying to 
turn the rocket in one direction and it'll be rolling in the other direction, uh, in the wrong direction because of the universal issue. So I saw this in a flight, which I'll show here in just a second, but that's the thing that sort of convinced me that, that I needed to uh, do a spin cam. And I'm just gonna take a, just a half a second here and look at comments. It looks like I don't see anybody telling me that nothing's working. So, okay. So this is a flight that, that, that really showed the control reversal effect. And if you look closely at the canards during the flight, you'll see that they're turned in a direction. Uh, well, first thing you'll see is that the rocket's rolling. Uh, and if you look closely, you'll see that the, uh, that the canards are trying to stop that roll, but they're not being successful. Uh, and then uh, a little ways into the flight, you'll see the booster drop off. And as soon as the booster drops off and the fins are not there below the canards any longer, uh, then all of a sudden the roll uh, stabilizes immediately. So you can, and if you start the control reversal there and the canards are shifted and they're trying to straighten up the rocket, but they can't. But then as soon as the booster falls off, the rocket immediately stabilizes uh, with respect to the roll rate. So that's when I figured out that uh, it, I needed to do something to prevent that effect. And, and there are other things that can be done other than the, the spin can that I developed, but that's the approach that I took to try to solve this effect. And the reason that you use a spin can is when the vortices hit the spin can, then the, the, the fins will turn, but the rocket won't. And so that's sort of the idea of it. And, and so this was a flight that had the, the uh, spin can on it. And I, if it hadn't had a spin can, that, the, that that would have gotten into the control reversal as well. So I think it helps out quite a bit. Uh, I'm really kind of trying to figure out what flights need a spin can and what flights don't. Um, but uh, hopefully someday I'll figure that out. So then we started doing a bunch of flights where uh, the idea was to correct to vertical. Uh, that's sort of, you know, a major objective. And so a lot of these flights, we basically launched at a, uh, you know, an angle and then watched the rocket go to, to a, a vertical because of the control system. Uh, and so we, we tried that for a while on different control formats and different gains and different canard sizes and tried to come up with, uh, you know, an understanding of, of how fast was the rocket turning and, you know, and all of the aerodynamic factors associated with the canards. And this was one flight that was really kind of interesting. I really wish I would have had a ground video flight, but we basically launched it at a 12 degree angle. Uh, and it, 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 it actually weathercocked as much as 30 degrees. And, and then over time, as it got going a little bit faster, the canards just brought the rocket to vertical. So you have to, in this video, you have to watch the the smoke, but you know because my the, the ground video the, didn't work out very well. But it was a, a a very cool flight to watch, and and if you just watch that smoke rain, you can see the the rocket just uh, going from a pretty good angle uh, up to vertical at the end of the flight. So that was that was a pretty interesting flight. The other or another vertical flight that I did was with the uh, with the, the, the three-stage flight. And this was the flight I did that went to 175,000 feet. And this flight had the orientation module again between the first and the second stage. And so the idea is after the, uh, the booster falls off, now the orientation module is gonna second and third stage is back to vertical. And so hopefully you'll have less dispersion. So this is some data from that flight. Uh, and this, this red line is sort of the weighted average of the, uh, of the tilt data. This is tilt over here on the right. And it goes from about zero up to about uh, five and a half. And so th this is the part of the flight that the system was not operating until the booster there was booster burnout and then booster separation. And so now with the booster gone, now we have the, 
the vertical control period for about a six second period here during the coast. And so you can see, in, and then the, the second stage lit right around this point here. So you can see that there was initially some tilt on the rocket and, and uh, it only got up to about five degrees, but if it had continued on that trajectory up until the point in time when the, the second stage lit, it 10 degrees or something like that uh, at the time the second stage lit. And on a 175,000 foot flight, that's about a 20 mile recovery. Uh, and at, at Black Rock, uh, there's there's no good direction where you can go 20 miles and and easily recover your rocket, but with the orientation system, it brought it back to vertical. And at the point in time uh, when it fell off the rocket, it was down to about one and a half degrees. And so this particular flight landed uh, about uh, just under three miles from the pad. So I thought that was a, a very successful flight for the system. So um, then we embarked on a, a set of flights where basically we're trying to fly at a specified tilt. So instead of going to uh, vertical, we're going to fly at, a, at an angle uh, off at some specified bearing. So we say, OK, fly at 15 degrees um, and fly in this particular. So we did some flights where we looked into doing that. Uh, and this is a flight where we you know, you can you can sort of see the launch rail there. We 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 launched the rocket about five degrees to the left, uh, and we told it to go to vertical and then to go ten degrees to the right. So it started off; it went vertical and then it went ten degrees to the right, which is just pretty much what we told it to do. And then some of the flights that we're doing uh, at the moment. We, we, we decided if we could make one change in tilt and bearing, we could make a bunch of changes uh, and, and uh, you know, and see, see if we could maybe do some patterns. And, and it's, not, it's not just silly, because in, in order to do patterns, you have to have a pretty good understanding of how fast the rocket changes bearing from one set point to the next, and how fast does it change tilt from one setting to the next. So you have to get in, Look pretty closely at the data and how the rocket responds to the the, the uh, angle and size of the canards and the velocity of the rockets uh, in order to be able to do this. Uh, this is one of the flights that that I did. I call it the uh, the infinity squared flight. Uh, and the idea it was a two stage flight with a short boost to get things moving. And then uh, we did a change to seven and a half degree bearing, and then we drew a couple of infinity signs up. So there you can see the first change in bearing there. And now we're just going to make 45 changes in bearing and uh, draw some infinity signs as we go up just to show that we actually are able to do it. And, and naturally, towards the end of it, I managed to find a cloud. But we, you could see most of them with the pad cam view. So at least we were able to, to do that. And then I did another flight similar to that. I call it the Python flight, because in this flight, instead of changing bearing, which is relatively easy, this flight changed tilt. And so the idea of it was we would fly it up to a 16 degree tilt in one direction, and then fly a 16 degree tilt in the other direction, and then just kind of keep going back and forth. And, and it, it actually worked pretty well. Um, Pretty much the same flight, kind of a short burn booster motor. And then I've got the long burn. Uh, it was a L395, I think it's like burn motor. And, and you can see that it basically just does those oscillations. And you can see that I managed to hit another cloud. I, I have a, a, a problem with clouds. It was perfectly clear three minutes before this. Uh, but you can see that, that mo most of the changes that uh, uh, that were intended during the flight. And like I say, one of the things that, that we had to do to be able to do this flight is to look back at the data that we had and, and try to understand how fast does the rocket turn for a given set of conditions. Uh, 
and there's a lot of scatter in the data because these are rocket flights and so uh, nothing is perfect but um, I tend to um, limit the canard motion to about um, seven and a half degrees and you can turn a rocket there at about 40 degrees per second so if you work at it you can make them turn pretty fast. So in terms of future development um, is to just try to make vertical orientation systems more accessible uh, to the rocketry community. Uh, it contributes to safety by reducing dispersion. I, I can tell you that when, when I fly a rocket where it does, I don't have this on there, uh, I'm pretty apprehensive because I don't know where the rocket's going to go. But when I fly the orientation system, I do. And so um, it, it really does that. Uh, it, it's also technically challenging, and there, there's a lot of skill, skill areas that are involved. Um, you know, the rocket itself and the aerodynamics and the electronics, you know, control theory, there's, there's a lot of skills that are involved. And so I uh, am glad to see a, a couple of universities that I'm working with that are involved in, in doing this kind of project, because I think it's just perfect for universities. And the other thing I can also tell you is it's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, I've flown this system like over 30 times and, and I can't wait to fly it the next time. I've got a, two systems queued up to fly just as soon as I can get a, a launch day that isn't, um, isn't horrible weather. So my first attempt at expanding things was a beta test group that I established in 2015. And, and at that point in time, six flyers, uh, all, all, I, all I gave them were the, con, the control boards uh, and a set of instructions. And there were some flights that were performed, I think two or three of them, uh, maybe, maybe more. Um, but they didn't, they didn't tend to work very well. Uh, we didn't have a lot of success, and it really didn't um, do anything to expand the, uh, the accessibility to the technology. So I decided in early 2022 to try it again. So the first thing I did was to redesign the system. Uh, and I call this the Voss 2 system. Uh, I made it more user friendly so you can uh, calibrate the canards and do the battery charging and so forth more easily uh, than the original system. And I also made it more portable. So you can see here on bearing is now on the module as opposed to the airframe. So that makes it a lot easier to move this from one airframe to the next. Uh, and uh, also got a good buddy of mine to 3D print the, the uh, trays on this thing. And we sort of co-designed uh, the unit and made the millions of little changes to try to, try to make it better. Uh, and so that reduces the fabrication time from a, a couple of days to, or a couple of you know, months to you know, just a few days to kind of get everything put together. And I've also got a lot better documentation and support. And, and I also have built spin cans so that people who want to fly the system uh, a little more aggressively, you know, they, they might need a spin can. And so I give them the, you know, this part of it and, and they mount their whatever fins they want on the, the part of the spin can that actually moves. So I did a demonstration of the Voss 2 system, and this is actually the that I was talking about a little bit earlier. And, and I use what I call the near vertical flight profile, which basically just tells the rocket to fly at a 12 degree angle uh, based on the direction that you set up the rocket on the pad. Uh, and so this flew at a 12 degree angle in a strong crosswind. And if you can look at the GPS path, you can see that indeed it, it flew at that angle. And, and the interesting thing about this way of flying the rocket uh, is that you still get a soft deployment at Apogee. If you just fly a rocket at an angle, uh, it's going to arc over and it's going to start developing a lot of horizontal velocity. And so the idea uh, is that it, the control system is still trying to bring the rocket to vertical, even as you get towards Apogee. So you never develop that much horizontal velocity and you still get a soft deployment at Apogee. So here was the test flight. And, and the thing to look at in this test flight is what does it look like 
at apogee. So here it's flying along at a 12 degree angle. Uh, and uh, as it gets towards apogee, you can see it'll start to arc over just a little bit, but not very much. And so there's just not a whole lot of uh, horizontal velocity at apogee. So you, you're not going to shred suit uh, shoots and zipper the airframe and that sort of thing. So I've started a second beta test group in 2022, and we currently have uh, 12, uh, 10 flyers that have the VOS2 systems. And the, the objective for the beta group is to first off, have them develop their own rocket designs. I mean, I figured out what I did wrong in 2015, and I have a, a system that's a little bit more plug and play, but it still has to go into a rocket, and, and it's not as easy as it sounds. So they develop their own rockets, conduct flight testing, report back to the group, uh, give me some design input and uh, review the documentations and manuals, and then do what beta testing is, which is to um, evaluate the performance of something in the real world. Um, some tests, and I expect to see uh, actually quite a bit more here in the next couple months, but one of them uh, was done by Paul Snow at uh, FAR not uh, too long ago, maybe uh, six weeks or something like that. Uh, and this was a nice flight. He had this set in the vertical flight mode. This was a L1050 and he went to a little over 7,000 feet. And the, the thing that was the, the, the most interesting about this flight was how almost perfectly vertical uh, the rocket was at, at Apogee. So one of the things I've done is I've started something called Voss Visions LLC. Uh, and that's for the purpose of getting some liability protection in case one of these beta testers does something silly. Um, I've produced 12 systems and at the present time there's 10 beta testers. So if you do the math, uh, that means there's two of them left that are available for folks that might have an interest in participating in this beta testing. Uh, in the future, I can produce more systems but at this point in time, there's actually no more control boards remaining. Uh, th there may be some made and there may not, so I don't know. Uh, we, the 12 may be the, the most there ever is, or there may be some more in the future. But in any case, supplies will be limited. Uh, but if you have an interest in the technology, uh, there's some contact information on there, and you can contact me if you're interested. And so that is the the end of the presentation, and I got to figure out how to get out of this. And so I'm, if I've got questions or not. Um, okay, I see four questions. Is there a bearing system in the spin can or is it just a brushing type fit? Yes, there's bearings in there. Um, they're actually very small. They're five, eight inches, which just happens to be about the width of the, uh, of the airframe tube sections that they're sitting on or sitting between. And 0.085 vapor, it's just unbelievable how they want to get away from you. Um, do you know your control loop bandwidth, open loop crossover frequency? Um, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. Um, control loop bandwidth. I'm sorry, I just don't. Um, what is the maximum canard rotation angle that you allow? Uh, in this system for you, um, I, I allow the... Uh, yaw pitch response to go up to seven and a half degrees. Uh, and then if for a rocket angle of up to seven and a half degrees, and I'll typically set the um, uh, the response to be that same seven and a half degrees. So as the rocket tilts over, we'll uh, adopt, uh, um, the canards will stay vertical basically as you tilt the rocket up to seven and a half degrees. Above seven and a half degrees, the, the canards are pinned. So they don't continue to change. They stop changing at seven and a half degrees and, uh, uh, and go no further. 
there, there's a, an additional seven and a half degrees of canard movement that could occur as a result of roll control. So in the worst case where the rocket's rolling like mad and tilting like mad, you could have as much as 15 degrees in the canard tilt. And, and I don't go higher than that because uh, I think if you get it much higher than that, the canards will just stall. Now, I, I've, seen a, I've, I've really never actually seen much of a case where the canard angle is more than just a few degrees, uh, actually, unless there's a set point change the, that's more significant than that. But generally, you can move things around with just a few degrees of, uh, of canard angle. And that's one of the lessons that I've learned from this. It, it really does not take much motion uh, or, or much of a canard angle to move a rocket around. Uh, and I would say in the case of a vertical flight where you're not trying to change the bearing or change the tilt or something like that, you can go with remarkably small canard movements and, and do a vertical flight. of thin area to canard angle that works well. Uh, I, I don't know what the ratio would be. Um, I, I used to think when we were starting this that what we would do is we would have a set of canards uh, and we would change the, the, the gain of the servos. So maybe instead of that seven and a half degrees, maybe we go motion to, um, you know, a couple two or three degrees for higher flights. But uh, I'm pretty sure the, the beta group testing is gonna show that a better strategy is to allow those same canard movements, but just decrease the size of the canards for faster flights or flights where you don't want a lot of control authority. And I've kind of gone through some calculations. Uh, I think if you were gonna fly this system somewhere approaching Mach 2, for example, you're gonna want canards that are about the size of a postage stamp, and that would provide all the control authority you need for a high-speed flight uh, like that. So I, uh, let's see, oh, a couple more questions. How much does the system weigh? Uh, the, the Voss 2 system weighs uh, just under three pounds uh, for the control module. Uh, the, uh, fin, the, the spin can itself, as provided, fins attached is about two and a half pounds. So it's not negligible. Um, most, most of the time you would, you would fly a system like this with K motors through M motors. Um, but it, it would be possible. Uh, I, I've, I've sort of wondered, I'd really like to try flying something like a, you know, maybe a, a something like a fiberglass level one rocket, you know, four inch the systems designed for four inches and could be used for five inch, but four inches the size and just put it on top of something like a level one um, uh, fiber, but fiberglass rocket and bring it down single deploy and fly it on J motors. So I, I think something like that would be possible, but I've, I've, I've never done that. Uh, will we be releasing the system open source? Um, I think parts of it are open source, uh, and uh, I'm I'm really going to be sort of obtuse. I'm not. Uh, I can I can respond on questions. I'm not sure. I just want to um, have things like the uh, well certain aspects of it just generally available to anybody. Uh, so I'm I'm not real familiar with uh, uh, open source code and where I where I do things like that. But I'm my, my my current feeling is that I need to be a little bit careful about doing that. So I do not see any more questions. And so I, I, I guess we're done. Uh, if anyone has, uh, would like to get any more information on the, um, get any more information on the system, or if you have an interest, like I say, there's two of them left and that may be it. Uh, just feel free to contact me. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. Watching, appreciate it.